Bible today, if you would, uh, to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27, this is considered Palm Sunday. It's the Sunday that our Lord entered Jerusalem. He was there several days before certainly he was betrayed, falsely tried, beaten, and eventually crucified. Uh, when uh, you see the black screen, the black screen's up there for a reason. Now, let me tell you, this is not the typical outline on here because I have been without internet since on Friday evening and uh, still down today. And uh, so anyhow, I have done the best with what I could on a program uh, that I could give you. No pictures, needless to say, because I have none in my computer. Uh, I guess I could have searched and done some seeking and searching there, uh, but had no internet to pull and draw from. So uh, you bear with just words today. Can you do that with the outline? And uh, we'll get through this thing, all right? Uh, open, open again your Bible, chapter 27, and let's begin reading at verse 45. Chapter 27. Begin reading at verse 45, and thank you for honoring God's word this morning, standing. Notice uh, this is, of course, the death of the cross, and uh, Jesus is dying. From the cross, he made seven statements. We'll go into uh, four of those very briefly. And uh, this is one of the seven that he made, and actually it was the fourth statement that he made on Calvary's cross. Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour. That is uh, literally from 12, uh, from, uh, 12 noon all the way up until 3 o'clock, uh, our time. And uh, so for three hours, it got pure dark outside. Uh, some have suggested it was eclipse of the sun. However, uh, that uh, cannot be substantiated in history, nor can it be substantiated in science either as well, because there has never been an eclipse around the globe at one time. It is usually in a region. It is usually in an area because of what an eclipse is. Uh, so that has certainly been exaggerated and uh, propagated. Uh, just again, try and take away from God, God's supernatural ability to do supernatural things and do the miraculous. But this is a supernatural, miraculous darkness. Uh, it's the similar darkness that was down in Egypt that could actually be felt. I mean, man, how would you like to be at noonday? Now, yesterday at noonday, it was hammering here, amen? And it looked semi-dark, but it was a long, far cry from being dark. But this darkness is unusual. This is in middle of the day. This is when the sun in Palestine was the hottest. It is when the sun would be at its pinnacle and its brightest. And yet in the middle of that, God literally pulled over a shade or a curtain over the sun and refused to let the sun shine. And there's some reasons for that, and we're going to talk about that today. Read with me, if you would, continuing in verse 46 and about the ninth hour. Jesus cried with a loud voice. He didn't whisper this. He didn't uh, just say this. The Bible says that he cried out loud. Uh, uh, it would be similar to a shout. He wanted everybody to be able to relate to what he was saying and to be able to hear and substantiate some of what he was going through. And by the way, this is the only time Jesus even gives any kind of reference to what he's been to and been through. Everything up to this point has been thinking of others. This is the only agonizing cry the Lord Jesus ever made. It's the only one that indicates what his soul was really bearing and what his uh, life was really enduring at that mindset. Ladies and gentlemen, you have no idea. We can't humanly comprehend what the Lord Jesus, the Son of the living God, was enduring at this particular moment of time. Don't you ever for one minute believe because salvation is free that salvation is cheap. Amen? It is anything but cheap. Carrying you to heaven, if you get to go because you trusted Christ as Savior, is an expensive task with Almighty God. And man, this is just uh, the beginning of uh, the, there's just a glimpse of the agony that the Son of God is going through. And by the way, he endured this for three solid hours. And uh, some interesting things I dug up and interesting things that I studied when I studied this. And I preached on this statement before. So it's a new outline and uh, a couple of repeat illustrations because they fit. But other than that, I hope it will be a blessing to you. But notice what he cried out. Eli, Ama, Abachathani, that is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? I want to speak on one little word forsaken 
forsaken. Are you aware that probably no one in this entire room has probably no ever been totally forsaken? In fact, I can prove that. There's nobody in this room that God's forsaken yet. Lest you inhale, you are still unforsaken. Amen? There is, you say, but my family turned on me. Oh, but sometimes God gives you that little stream in the desert, doesn't he? With a new friend or a co-laborer or a neighbor, somebody that befriends you. Very few ever can really say, I feel 100% absolutely forsaken. But when God's son said it, God come in the human flesh, said, I am totally abandoned. I am totally forgotten. I am totally rejected. I am totally deserted. It means everything and much, much more than what we can humanly comprehend. When Jesus says, Eli, Eli, lama thasabachathana, my God, my God, why you above all else, why you above anyone else would forsake me? in this hour in time of need well i got the answer simply put it but we're going to do it dig it a little bit deeper all right the simple answer is he was forsaken so brother harold wouldn't have to be so uh what's his face right here wouldn't have to be uh, so she wouldn't have to be uh, so i wouldn't have to be uh, so those over here wouldn't have to be so man don't you ever treat god's salvation much less jesus the son of god lightly or frivolously and just take for granted the amazing work of salvation and what it cost God the Father let's pray I Heavenly Father thank you so much for uh, the good uh, spirit thank you for this Palm Sunday and thank you for what you did uh, somewhere about this time frame uh, many many years ago over 2,000 years ago that you sent a lamb that you sent uh, Lord a sacrifice that you sent a substitute and that substitute was Jesus and, Father, how we praise you and how we glorify you and how we honor you and how we're, we're so glad to be saved by him today and for his glory. I pray, Father, today that maybe someone that's uh, assembled in this house today might come to the understanding that they're lost and on the road to hell and they need to trust this sacrifice, this substitute, this one that was abandoned by his own Father and God so that they would never have to be. So, Father, speak to our hearts today. Holy Spirit, I can't preach without you. God, you know that. I know that. This congregation knows that. And, God, I, help, I pray that you would help me this morning. I pray that you would give me that special endowment, that special touch of God, and give me freedom and liberty as we speak. And, uh, Lord, I know the screen is not going to be as attractive as it has been in the past, maybe. But, Lord, I pray you'll bless it and use it for your glory and honor. And we'll give you praise for what you do. In Jesus' name we pray and ask. And all of God's church and people said, Amen. Would you be seated? Forget which way to turn this thing. <laughs> At age 41, this lady married a very, very famous man. She was 41 when she got married. That's pretty, pretty old in this standard day and time. Elizabeth Barrett married Robert Browning. And uh, in that marriage, uh, uh, it was a, a good marriage, a decent marriage. A biographer has wrote certainly about the great poet of England, but also has also biographically sketched and given us some information about his wife, Elizabeth Barrett. Elizabeth Barrett grew up in a very, very happy home, but because she was 41 when she got married, her father tried to dispersuade her about marriage. Did not want her to leave home. Did not want any of his children to leave home. And it became so bad upon getting married that her father literally told her, I don't ever want to hear from you again. I don't want you to ever contact me again. I am through with you. You need to stay home with your family. You didn't need to get married at this age. And I'm just ticked off, and I don't ever want to hear your name again. He literally went to such extremes, church, that he almost eradicated her name from the family records. It was horrible. But Elizabeth never gave up. Even after moving away from England and living in Italy for five years, while she was gone for five years, she wrote to her husband, I mean her father, over 300 love letters. 
of forgiveness and grace and, and wanting to extend mercy and, and say, Dad, this has gone too long. It's gone too far. This ought not to be in a family. And I want us to be reconciled. And I want you to know I love you. Man, she gave birth in Italy to children. And man wanted him to be involved with the grandchildren. No comment. No letters. No reciprocation whatsoever. Elizabeth, upon hearing that her father had died, she returned to England to attend the funeral service and the burial. When she returned to England, she discovered that her father had bundled up all 300 and some of her letters in just five years written to him. You calculate that, that's a whole lot of writing. And what was amazing to her was this. Not one solitary letter had ever been opened. Even the ones that she thought would grab his heart and his attention, given in a black envelope in that day, sealed with black wax, which indicated sorrow and suffering or possibly bereavement or death. When she saw that, it literally broke her heart, and she literally ran out and screamed, totally abandoned, totally forsaken but can I tell you ladies and gentlemen she was wrong she had not been totally forsaken she was not totally bad she had Robert as her husband that still loved her she had children that still cared for her oh but more importantly she still had God Almighty that loved her are you with me there is no time no place no place that you will ever come unless you go to hell that you will be totally abandoned totally forgotten, totally forsaken, as we see in the text this morning. When Jesus was on the cross, it was uh, one word. This word has to be very haunting to anyone that certainly is made to feel like they're forsaken or forgotten. It has to be a word of pain. It has to be a word that certainly indicates heart-renting and uh, heart-crushing uh, blow to anyone that would even say, you know what, I feel totally forsaken. Must be a horrible, lonely, lonely feeling. But can I serve notice to you today? There is no comparison to what Jesus Christ went through for you and for me. There is none here that can compare or none here that can even associate everything that is totally involved in this one little statement the Lord Jesus made both in Arabic as well as in Hebrew. Part of the sentence is in Arabic. The other part is in Hebrew, in the original language. Yet just the same both statements were heard and known well by those who were closest to the cross and heard him shout this out. How was the Son of God forsaken? When he cried out, my God, my God, why have you of all else forsaken me? Well, he was forsaken by his fellow countrymen. The Bible says over the Gospel of John chapter 1 that he came into his own and his own received him not. Men loved darkness rather than light. And when light came into the world, they rejected the light. And multitudes and more in this world today are still rejecting that light than are coming to the light of the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, friend, if you're here today and you've rejected his light, if you've rejected him, can I encourage you, come to this light. Come to Jesus today before it's eternally too late. Jesus, as I preached last week in the play, is going to demonstrate, hey, Jesus is coming. He may come sooner than you think, sooner than many want him to come, no doubt. So as he was forsaken by his fellow countrymen. Hey, he was forsaken by followers. Hey, the Bible has already suggested before this occasion, even around the cross, he could only see a few familiar faces. Can I tell you, dear ladies, this is a great plus and a check mark for every woman in the house. The ones that refused to forsake him were supposedly the weakest of humanity. It was the women. When she looked out in the crowd, she saw only one disciple still there. All the others had fled and were totally forsaken him now I say that to say this friends can sometimes and followers sometimes can forsake a, hey his own family 
Hey, don't forget, some of those disciples, some of the writers of the Bible were half-brothers of Jesus. They never got it. They never understood about Jesus. They never understood. Hey, this one didn't come to alleviate pain and sorrow to start off with. That's going to be done later when he comes back a second time. But for now, he must come to suffer and bleed and become a substitute for our sin. God's divine righteous payment so that you that are sinful might become his righteousness in and through him. That's the gospel in a nutshell. Amen? Family. All of those were enough to crush most people's hearts and spirits. But what was so crushing to the Son of God when he cried this in agony and in despair? I think with all my heart, this is the one that he couldn't understand. This is the one that he couldn't humanly comprehend. Why? Father, you and I have been close. You and I through all time, past, and eternity. You and I helped create these that now are killing me. These that are now inflicting pain and sorrow to me. Why on earth would you not turn your face toward me? I think really the Father's forsakenness was where his soul felt the greatest anguish and the greatest pain. Amen? Forsaken of the Father, why? So that you and I would never be, amen, so we would go unforsaken. He endured the darkness so that we might be able to know the light and live in the light, praise God. Jesus left the glories of heaven to come to the, the grief on earth, why? So that he might present to you and I the perfect exhibition, the perfect demonstration of God's almighty love for sinful man. And you're a sinner just like I am. But oh, thank God, God loved you, and God loved us. Amen, and he sent his son, and he gave him to bleed, suffer, and die for us. Man, literally in this text, murders his maker. Think about that. You see, the maker now becomes a man, the sovereign now becomes a servant, and the prince now becomes nothing more than a pauper. One of the uh, gospels, all four gospels portray Jesus in one of four ways. All of them writing differently, all of them presenting Jesus in a different portrait, if you would. Mark's gospel presents him as the suffering servant. And man, can I serve notice to you, ladies and gentlemen, he suffered like no man ever suffered. You say, hey, many other died uh, for his followers. Yeah, they did. But can I serve notice to you, nobody died ever like Jesus died. And we're going to look at that just in a moment. Crucifixion was a, a, a pattern, was a means to an end for Rome. Rome actually discovered it by the Persians. It was introduced in history by the Persians. But Rome devised it, streamlined it, made it even more gory and more excruciating because they added something that the Persians did not add to it. They added not only the way that the nails were driven, but they also added to the crucifixion uh, uh, something that was preparatory. Before anyone, I don't care who they were, were crucified, they must always first endure the whipping post or the scourging post. And again, as you have seen exhibited on this platform every Easter since Brother J.R. has restarted doing our Easter Passion Play, let me remind you that that piece was a, a stick, if you would. Nailed to the end of that stick was nine strips of whipping leather, like you would whip a horse. And inside the uh, leather stripping were bits of glass and metal. And many never made it to the cross because many bled to death long before they ever were crucified. And the Roman soldier who was the strongest and the one hand-picked and trained how to just inflict the most damage to the human body knew exactly how to rip the flesh right from the rib cage. I believe with all my heart, and some of you and many of you have seen the passion. The best thing I saw when I was in Washington, D.C., before that thing ever hit the movie theaters is to go and give a... Uh, uh, a, a dissertation, if you want to, or an essay, or writing on what I thought about the film, and as a preacher of the gospel, what was left out, what wasn't included. And of course, I, I knocked it because of one thing, didn't have a resurrection. That was my problem. That was a big problem for me. I didn't like the devil either. I can't imagine the devil looking feminine. Amen and amen. And that one looked feminine, even though she looked wicked as the devil. She looked like a couple gals I dated in high school, to be honest with you. But anyway, um, but... Uh, it was just 
uh, gruesome. But the thing that I bragged about to Gibson was this. You have done probably some justice to the scourging post. you got to understand, y'all did not see the scourging I got to see. When I got the real movie, it had been cut to smithereens. You only saw a little bit of it. Man, in his original movie that he made before being edited, and maybe some said it's just too gross, gruesome, he had done a phenomenal job. I mean, you've seen bits of meat flying against the wall constantly. You've seen the rib cage. I don't know how they did it. Had to do it by computer. He, ripping his rib cage literally with the bits of leather as it came around his waist. I mean, you talk about authentic. It was everything I had, in, I had envisioned that my Savior endured and went through. And except there was much, much more involved in it. You see, because we can only visual what physically happened. We cannot humanly begin to comprehend at all what in the spiritual realm was taking place at the same time frame that he was enduring the physical. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to understand, when Jesus made this cry, he was not crying out because of his pain physically. He, all of a sudden, only spoke of himself at all because of what he was enduring spiritually. Now, hear me and hear me well, and I'm just going to say this one time, we're going to move on. When Jesus Christ was forsaken on the cross, if the Son of the living God, the one who had always known fellowship with the Father, would cry out when he was abandoned, forsaken by God, still on earth, on the cross, on the tree, because he who knew no sin became sin for us. I can't humanly comprehend how those in hell are going to be abandoned when they die without hope, without grace, without mercy, and they live forever in a place called the lake of fire, to be honest and frank. It ought to make flaming evangelists and soul winners of us all. Amen? It ought to make us want to check every soul out that comes into our presence to make sure they know Jesus. Are you with me? About 9 o'clock in the morning, the first statement of the Son of God came forth from his lips. He was whispering for the most part. And among, among those who were preparing his body around and on the cross, he cried out, Father, forgive them. Talking about the soldiers. Talking probably even about the religious crowd. And you do understand the only reason Jesus died was because of the religious crowd. And by the way, the most unmerciful, the most godless, the most heathen, the most worst crowd to be around is a religious person. Did you hear me? I didn't say saved person. I said religious person. They don't see their lostness. They don't see their need for God. They don't see their need of repentance. They don't need to see. They don't see their sin. They don't see anything. They just feel comfortable. Hey, I'm all right. Man, I made a little profession of faith when I was five, and I'm, I'm doing well. And yet they'd never have had a real, genuine, born-again experience with the Son of God, Jesus Christ. Hey, the religious crowd put him on the cross, folks. Don't you ever think that when we Christians who truly got the real McCoy, and I'm getting ready to preach a sermon on the real McCoy, uh, I want you to understand, we who got the real deal, the real thing, don't you dare for one minute think the religious society of this world loves us. They do not. We rub their side. Man, we rub them all the wrong way. Amen? So we need to understand it. But then mid-morning, he turned to a repentant thief, and he said, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Second statement. Then the third statement, he looked out in the crowd, didn't see many loving faces, didn't see many faces protruding any kind of mercy, extending any kind of compassion to him at all. But finally he gazed in the crowd, and he found just a little huddle of about three to four people, one man in the midst with three other women. One of those women were Mary, his mother. She had not forsaken him. She was down there probably just as in, in the film, weeping and crying profusely. She wanted so much to help him, so much to be there with him and for him. But the best she could do is stand idly by and watch Rome do their disastrous blows and eventually watch God the Father do his worst blow of all you got to understand, when you read over in Isaiah chapter 53, ladies and gentlemen, 
Something that's mind-boggling I got a hold of when I first got saved blew my ever-loving mind. That the greatest suffering and the one that killed the Son of God was the Father. It wasn't the Jews. It wasn't Rome. They just were tools. It was God that did it. God hath laid on him our iniquities and our transgressions. It was God, the Bible says in Isaiah 53, that smitten, smote him on Calvary's cross. That same God that reaches out to you today in tenderness and mercy and compassion and love and says, will you come? Will you trust me? Will you trust what I've provided? Would you trust my son for what he's done, what he's accomplished? And if you choose not to take his exit, if you choose not to take his salvation, if you choose not to believe in the Son of God as Savior, then God has no other detour plan, pardon the expression. Then you truly will experience just a a tremendous taste of what the Son of God tasted at Calvary. But he saw John. He saw Mary. He saw a couple of other ladies. And the Bible says that he spoke a third statement. John, behold your mother. What, did he, what was he saying that for? Hey, all who have researched it out and thought about it, he's saying, John, you know I'm leaving you. I can't be here for mom anymore. I can't watch over her as I have quite physically in the past. It's going to be now passed on to you, John. You need to take care of my, my mama. You need to take care of your mom. They were half-brothers. And so he turns to John and says, you take care of mama. Boy, can you imagine? Jesus is in greatest physical pain. And yet the first three things out of his lips has nothing to do with his sorrow, nothing to do with his suffering, nothing to do with his pain, nothing to do with him. It has everything to do with about others. Can I tell you, I know my heart is cold compared to what it used to be like. I'm serious. And yours is too. Almost everybody here is. When I first got saved, and I got a hold of these scriptures, and I read the Gospels many, many times through as a young baby in Christ, I wanted it to be absorbing it in my soul of what Jesus did for me. Can I tell you, I'm dead serious. I could never pick up the Gospels. I could never get somewhere along Luke uh, 23, 24, Matthew 26, 27 without starting to bawl like a baby. Can I tell you today, I don't cry like that quite as much. You don't either, by the way. Can I tell you what's happened? We just got too used to what he's done for us. From the preacher in the pulpit to the people in the pew. We've made a song out of it to sing about it. We've seen it demoed and, and exhibited on platforms so much that it really does. I understand well why Lester Roloff said he said about the death of Jesus and the crucifixion of Jesus. No more stirs the, the, the Christian's heart than a dead rabbit they see lying in the road. It doesn't move us much. It doesn't stir us like it used to. But it really ought to. Man, you have no comprehension, church, what God did that day and how his heart was rent in pain and agony himself. We focus on Jesus and what he went on the cross and what he accomplished, and thank God that he did that. But we hardly ever think about what the Father was enduring at the same moment of time. You say, well, it was his plan. It was. You say it was his idea. No, it was their idea. All three, the Spirit, the Father and the Son participated in the plan. You say, but God knew he was going to raise him from the dead. That doesn't relinquish the, the sorrow as he saw in physical form, physical flesh, that his dear, sinless, perfect son was enduring that day, and he had no option. He could not reach out a helping hand. He had helped others, but he refused to help his son. Why? Again, you're the answer and so am I because he loves us that much. Oh, what love. Amen? I got to hurry. Then at high noon became midnight at midday. Dr. R.G. Lee actually preached a sermon on that text and called that sermon that. Midnight at midday. Pretty good sermon title. The last three of the last six hours, he states, 
Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you now forsaken me? He endured pain the first three hours without saying anything. But when he endured those last three hours up until 3 p.m., he cried this in the very beginning stages. Why? I want you to see if I could very quickly. i got to move through some of this. Uh, the sabachthani simply means forsaken. What it means, it means to be abandoned, to be let go, to literally leave someone completely without any mercy, grace, or help whatsoever. I want to share with you four thoughts from this text. Number one, I want you to see the darkness that's involved, certainly, uh, that surrounded him. The Bible says at this very hour of the cross, up to this point, they've been light. But all of a sudden, right at about noon, midday, looked as though it was the darkest of dark midnights. Why? Why was that so? There are four darknesses taught in the Scripture. Uh, how many of you, how many of you growing up ever had, anybody here ever have a phobia of darkness? Well, good. Some of you are honest. Wonderful. And, and I think all of us have some, don't, to some degree. I think we grow out of it. Some of us do. Some of us, some of us never grow out of it. Uh, I still make my, my wife get up at night when thieves sound like they're breaking in the house. Amen? Uh, I figured if, 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 if they shoot her first, I got a chance to get my gun loaded and shoot him afterwards, all right? And I'll be all right even though she'll be gone, all right? But anyway, uh, I'm only joking. Little boy that feared the dark, I've told this to you before, but it's cute and it fits. Uh, scared to death, Christian mom said, hey, don't, don't worry, son. Hey, I want you to go out on, on the back porch and get the broom. Didn't have a light. And the little boy said, Mama, I can't do that. I said, I told you to go out and get that broom. I said, Mama, I can't do that. Why not? Because I'm scared of the dark. And so she thought it was a great time to teach her Bible principles. And so she taught him Hebrews 13. said, hey, Jesus is always with you. He'll know, never leave you or forsake. Hey, when you're out there, he's with you. He's out there. And so the little boy said, okay, Mama. So the little boy opened the door, yelled out, hey, Jesus, if you're out there, hand me that broom, would you please, all right? Hey, this darkness that Jesus endures was much worse and a greater fear than that little boy had. What is involved in this darkness? Uh, there are four things. I, I'm not going to have time to finish this sermon. This is things so deep. Uh, number one, he suffered the darkness of a sinner. Again, you say, what do you mean? He who had forever and ever and always, even before creation, was always in fellowship with his father knew only the bliss and the communion and the fellowship and, and the best the Father had. He gave to the Father and the Father gave to him. Now, for the first time ever since eternity passed, he discovers that's gone. That's completely eradicated. That is why he felt, was made to feel that because he was experiencing the darkness of a sinner. What do I mean? He who never sinned became sin for me. The impeccable, sinless, righteous, holy, perfect Jesus became a prostitute, became a drunkard, became a druggie, became a liar, became a thief, became a cheat, became an embezzler, became a liar. You name any sin you want to, they were all planted and placed on Jesus that day. You name any sin here, friend, you've ever committed anything you've ever done that's in your past. If you'll trust Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior today, or you already have, thank God your sin's gone. You know why? Because Jesus paid for it, and when he did, he didn't put an installment payment down. Praise God, he paid for it in full. Amen? It's gone. And no wonder the hymn writer sung, my sins are gone, my sins are gone. Man, they're gone this morning. Amen? Got a clean slate. And praise God. That we, hey, he, he was experiencing the darkness of suffering. Again, I don't think we can really physically comprehend the worst cancer, the worst heart condition, the worst automobile accident that causes a human body to go and suffer. Keep in mind, God has miraculously and in his mercy, even in our worst experience, so made your human body to where once it has brought to a certain level of pain, 
You want to know what happens? Your body immediately shuts down its pain mode. It goes into something called a coma. Not counting all the great strides to reduce pain and sorrow at death or with cancer patients or whatever uh, is the um, matter of what God has given us in this generation uh, medically. Painkillers, Jesus had none. The best they mustered was water. And sometimes they would, they would give some that were really going through it because they wanted to extend some mercy. Jesus had them. They wouldn't even give them water. He had to endure it all. Why? Because he was going through the hell you deserve and the I deserve. He was tasting truly what it absolutely means to die without hope, without Christ, without mercy, without love, and go to a devil's hell and live forever. Man, what a Savior. Boy, I'm glad he did that for me. Boy, am I glad he did that for me. Hey, there was the darkness of sacrifice. Are you aware that even sometimes when the sacrifices were made in the Old Testament, there are those that literally left vomiting because it was such a gory sight? Are you aware that even in our day, there are preachers and seminaries and those producing what they call preachers that are not? Or telling us that, man, y'all, y'all are too brutal. Y'all are too bloody. Man, y'all got this, and in term years ago, years ago, you speak slaughterhouse religion. And what they mean by that, you all the time talking about the blood, the blood, the blood, the blood. You better be talking about it because we're saved by the blood. Amen? And his blood had to be taken from him after he voluntarily gave it up. And it had to come through crucifixion because it was prophesied. The darkness of separation from just God. The light of the world literally is dying in darkness. The bright and morning star is dying with the blackness of sin. He who is the creator that made the very tree he was on is now nailed to the very tree he made with his own hands and by his own words from his mouth. Awesome thought. That's our Savior. That's our God. Captain of an aircraft, and I told this story many years ago. I think I told it actually on Easter. Was during World War II, true story. A sad one indeed. Literally discovered and was radioed the last message they were to receive that they needed to go dark. They needed to let all lights out. Aircraft carrier. They had five planes out on the mission. But they were told, listen, for the crew, for the ship's sake, and for the Thousands of men you have on board, you really need to go dark. And you need to keep it dark until we tell you it's safe. Because there were enemy subs in the area that had been spotted and been discovered. That captain of that ship had to make a tremendous decision. I've got to listen to orders. Number two, I've got to do it for the rest of the ship, the rest of the men. He called lights out. There was no communication. There was nothing. And each of those five pilots that were out on the mission came back with a successful mission. Each one coming, circling where the ship was supposed to be on their means of radar to discover where it was supposed to be. But unbeknownst to them, lights out. Everything that a ship produces any signal or sign from was completely shut down. They had no idea where that aircraft carried. Knew it was in the area radioed and with five different men five different pilots five different planes coming in they begin to hear the pleads and the begging we're back if you if you'd be so good so kind hey man we need the lights on lights on and they only sent one more message there is not going to be any light and they literally heard over their radio phones each one of those five pilots crashing to their death. All five gone. Because of one simple word. Because of the darkness. Can I tell you, church, there's a lot of darkness in the world today. But oh, I'm glad even in the darkest place, thank God the Son of Righteousness and the Son who is the light of the world still praise God, still can shine. Amen? And man, even at my darkest day, I got the light of the world right here glowing in my soul and in my heart. Amen? Hey, your worst experience you'll ever experience 
you got him if you know him. Amen? You will know never in this world ever be forsaken. And thank God for that. Amen? Where am I going? I have no earthly idea. When the high priest would go to make a sacrifice on the Holy of Holies, there's something that uniquely is identified when he made the sacrifice back in the Holy of Holies, not the brazen altar. That was out in the sunshine. That was out where eyes could see. Oh, i got to quit this walking, don't I, guys? Or tape something down or whatever. But anyway, when you, when you think of the high priest going into the Holy of Holies, one thing you'll discover is back there was the darkest in the tent. In fact, the Bible says it was in the dark that the sacrifice was made when the high priest went in. Why? Because it was a picture, perfect picture. Everything about the tabernacle, everything about every sacrifice was the perfect picture of what Jesus Christ was coming to do, thank God, which he accomplished over 2,000 years ago on Calvary's cross. He died in darkness. The sacrifice for the whole people must die as a sacrifice in the dark. Are you with me? And man, there's so many pictures. When you think of Mount Sinai, when Moses was given the law of God, we find again a darkness similar to maybe Egypt. Such a darkness that every man and woman feared it. They didn't even want to come near the mountain because of the darkness that they beheld. Why? Because when God's very finger wrote the commands of God and how we ought to live and knowing full well they would all be broken by all of us, that darkness is a picture of God's sensing and feeling of humanity and all of mankind breaking his commands, disobeying his, his word, uh, dishonoring what he desires all of us to do so that that darkness blanketing was a symbol of uh, how God's heart would be broken because of your sin and my sin. The second thing, not only the darkness, I want you to see very quickly the desertion that saddened him. The desertion that saddened him. When he came to that last three hours, and that ninth hour being three o'clock, he literally, eventually gave up the ghost. I want to call your attention. An unmistakable witness of the scripture is this text. I don't, man, I don't have time to develop this. I wish we could carry you through a journey of Psalm 22. I promise you I'll do that on Sunday night in the Psalms. One of the greatest Psalms in the Bible. One of the most power-packed chapters in all of the Word of God has to be Psalm 22. It is phenomenal. 33 individual, all-fulfilled Bible prophecies are contained in just Psalm 22 uh, pertaining to the death of Jesus Cross and his death on the cross. 33 of them. Tremendous field and saturated with Bible prophecy. But oh, when he cried out, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, what was he crying for? Because he had been totally deserted. And in that desertion, it had already been prophesied in Psalm 22. I don't have time to go through Psalm 22. This just gives you a little bit of the psalm outline very quickly. Number one, verses one through six, you see that he was the approach one. Man, you see the sorrow. You feel the agony. You hear the pleas of his heart to his God and to his Father. And then you see the rejected one. He was rejected by the people unmercifully. They even made mocking ridicule in front of him. He became the requesting one. He cried out, even on the cross, and it was all prophesied that he would do that. But he's the risen one in verse 22. He is the rejoicing one in verse 22. And thank God he's going to be the ruling one. Hey, the psalm starts off in gloom, but thank God it ends up in glory. Now listen and hear me well. Next Sunday, when you come to this presentation, you will see the goriness of the cross. You might even get to see the beating. I don't know what all is planned this year. But this I know. Don't ever think Easter is about the cross of Jesus Christ. Easter is everything about a living Christ, a living Savior, and a resurrected Lord. Amen? Man, get your eyes on what? Hey, it's not gloom and doom. It's victory. Amen? It's complete victory, and praise God that he is the righteous one. 
I want you to see the contempt of men. In Psalm uh, 22, you will see in verse 7 the contempt that the men had for him around the cross. Again, a fulfillment of Matthew 27, verse 39, where they would deride him and derail him. Hey, you saved others. Why can't you save yourself? And so you see the utter contempt of wicked hearts of men. You see the cruelty of men in Psalm 22. You see also uh, in Psalm 22 a dislocation on the cross. The Bible says in this verse, verse 14, that every bone in his body was what? Hey, anybody here ever have one little bone out of joint? Oh, hurt like the dickens. Amen? I mean, it hurts like the devil. (laughs) The devil can hurt you too, by the way. I mean, all oh, the excruciating pain is just one bone. But because the way crucifixion was done, every bone in his body, according to this text, came out of joint. Don't tell me he wasn't suffering immense pain physically. And yet what I find interesting, again, can't reiterate it enough, he did not cry out about his pain. He cried about the spiritual thing that he was sensing and feeling about his father forsaking him. That's mind-boggling to me. Totally mind-boggling. Then he suffered dehydration. According to the psalm, it was prophesied that he would become thirsty. My tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth is a a, a translation of it. His roof was as dry as a pot shed. Uh, John 18 was the fulfillment of that. Verse 28, I what? Thirst. And when they gave him something to drink, anybody recall what they gave him? Instead of water, they gave him Can I tell you what vinegar will do? It'll increase your thirst. It'll make your thirst worse. He had no idea until it came probably close to him and he jabbed it in his mouth and face. What was even containing it today? Maybe he could sense it or smell it. But in that, they were giving him no mercy whatsoever. Listen and hear me well, church, and i got to close. I hate this. Listen and hear me well. Jesus was given and shown absolutely no mercy by man. None. There's no sensing of compassion in the crowd other than Mary and John. None. No mercy. No grace. No reaching out in love. No even heart so moved with with a desire to say, you know what, this man's innocent. This man shouldn't be going through this. You don't read any of that. Hear me and hear me well. How can we then think if all of humanity that's supposed to have a compassionate spirit, humanity that reaches out to their own at times, and sometimes the worst of times, could absolutely unequivocally at this given hour extend and show absolutely not one second or thread of mercy to its creator and to the Son of God? No mercy. Why should we dare believe that God in the end talks about hell more than he does about heaven? Should ever extend a second chance or mercy to the wicked? You want to know who put Jesus on the cross, men and women? You did. I did. We all did. We all may as well have been there driving the spikes through his hands. We all may have been buffeting his face. We may all have crowned him with a crown of thorn to inflict more pain. And around this area of the head is a excruciating painful area that, that just drives pain sensors to the brain. You and I may as well have been there. Poof! I want nothing to do with the Son of God because our sin is what drove him there. And by the way, even though our sins put him there, thank God, it wasn't Rome that kept him there. It wasn't the Jewish people that kept him there. It was his love that caused him to go all the way and finish the work. Let me close with this. Thank God I don't want to end ever on a defeated note. My last point, I didn't give you the third one. I don't have time. Let me give you, thank God, the defeat that was accomplished. Hey, you got to look in Psalm 22. I don't have time to even expound on that. Are you aware that even his last statement on the cross, it is finished, was prophesied in Psalm 22 in a different way, in a different means? 
but it was. And then that passage is found over in John chapter 19, verse 30. When he cried out, it is finished. He cried out, to tell us to tell us Meaning that that which God had, had given him to accomplish, to fulfill all righteousness and holiness according to his laws, he accomplished it. And to take your sin and my sin in his own body and suffer our death and suffer our hell and suffer what we deserve for our sin, he accomplished it. And even descended, according to Paul, possibly in Ephesians, his very soul into hell for three hours. He accomplished it. But thank God when he came out of the grave, man, he conquered death. He conquered sin, and all oh, praise God, he even put a padlock on hell for all who would believe and trust in him as Savior and Lord. Amen? And thank God I discovered years ago, if I trust him, if I'd receive him, if I'd take him, he'd come into my heart, forgive all of my sin, give me a new change, a new start, a new life, a clean slate, and man, it has been glorious ever since. God saved my soul 40 years ago, soon to be 41 Christmas. Hey, thank God. Aren't you glad you saved this morning? Let me close with this. The battle was against the French forces led by Napoleon. Wellington was leading the Allied forces against France. That's why you ought not to eat French fries, amen. But anyway, um. They had a very poor system of communication in that day and hour. The people of England well knew Wellington and the forces and the allies were out in battle. The worst and the greatest heated battle of all the war. This would prove who would no doubt possibly become the victor. France or England and the allies. They had poor communication as we all know. There was one high pinnacle, the Cathedral of Winchester, or Winchester Cathedral as it's called. It was there that they planted a person, a man, to give the signal to the city and for communicating from city to city as best as they could back then with individual letters of what was happening as they got any kind of communication whatsoever. To make a long story short, from that tower, the highest pinnacle, came the signals one letter at a time. Two words and two words only. Wellington defeated. All of London, all of England, all of the Allies. That message transpired for several hours across the nation because immediately upon that message given, if you know anything about Europe and that portion of Europe, man, fog is horrible there. The moisture and humidity is terrible there. The rain is terrible there. And a fog descended almost about the time the man communicated the last letter and completely covered the area and certainly the cathedral tower. They had, man, such a gloom, doom spirit and a sadness enter their souls. We have been defeated. We have no hope. Man, we have no chance. Man, we are going down and we have gone down in defeat and their hearts were ripped until moments later actually several hours later when the fog lifted and some people looked up to the tower they began to see what was going to be not just two words again communicated the signal they knew full well they probably didn't get the whole message so he did it again this time it wasn't two words there, but rather there were four words signaled, a letter at each time. Wellington defeated Napoleon Waterloo. Man, all of a sudden the gloom and the doom, the, the regret, the remorse, the sadness was changed into immediate gladness. Why? Because here some people thought they had no hope. Here they thought, man, they are to be defeated. Listen and hear me well. Don't you leave Easter and think Jesus Christ was defeated. By the way, to Tetelestai is a military commanding term. It is one used in the Greek language of military Greek, which simply signifies one that is in complete control of every circumstance that will be in charge completely. Jesus on the cross was absolutely, friend, completely 
unreservedly in charge of the circumstances. Glory to God. That's because he's God. But he still did what he did for everyone here seated this morning. If you've been